So, uh, hey everybody, uh, Sandra Delaripa from Harvest Development Group, and uh, we are live today with Kelly O'Connor. She is Executive Vice President of Innovative uh, Product and People Solutions out of California. And today she is going to share with us five critical um, HR considerations for employers related to coronavirus. Uh, Kelly is an executive coach, and um, she also is executive director and founder of the GuideStar Platinum Rated 501c3 nonprofit, Start Giving Local. So uh, interesting because you serve both sides of the spectrum here. And um, I think what you're going to share with us today not only is good, solid information from the HR side, but also probably from your experience. So, uh, Kelly, thank you and welcome. Thank you, Sandra. Um, very happy to have the opportunity to join you. I uh, certainly wish it was under uh, less inauspicious circumstances. Um, the last two weeks for those of us in the United States and longer for those of us worldwide um, have really been unprecedented in terms of uh, the changes that we've all had to face both personally and professionally. And uh, the work that I do with On Its Axis, which is the uh, innovative product and people solutions firm that I have the opportunity to work with, um, is really helping organizations to scale and grow. Oftentimes, innovation occurs at times of change, and we help organizations navigate through times of change. Um, as a member of the Forbes HR Council, I also have the opportunity to collaborate with executive thought leaders in the human resources space on an online forum and through discussion groups. And I have certainly seen uh, the amount of confusion and um, change resistance that has occurred and I've particularly felt it in the nonprofit sector. Mm. Um, wearing, wearing my hat as a ED for a volunteer nonprofit. I also know that we typically are, are resource strapped to begin with. Um, we're consistently looking at operations, trying to control cost in operations. And so really today I wanted to take the opportunity to talk about HR considerations specifically as they apply to those of us in the nonprofit sector. And whether you have a combination staff of uh, paid employees and nonprofit volunteers, or you're largely working in the nonprofit sector, human resources is a consideration right now. And mm -hmm. it's one that, that we all have to face um, as, a, as a collective body. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. And you know what, Kelly, if, if our nonprofit friends or anything like I've felt this week, um, as I noted before we went live, I was thrown into some pool of disarray as far as what are the HR regulations, guidelines, expectations around how we work through this. And, um, you know, it forced me to look at some things. So you as a resource, I think is tremendous. And uh, I know that our nonprofit friends are gonna get a lot from this. Thank you so much. I will share um, just as a, a way of making sure that I'm as transparent as possible. Uh, I'm not an HR attorney. I don't have a legal background. I do work with organizations from the Fortune 2000 uh, to bootstrapping startups. Mm -hmm. uh, and I do have familiarity as a member of the American Staffing Association and um, as a member of the California Staffing Association but I don't know all local guidance uh, and compliance guidelines. So, of course, yeah. uh, you know, I, I want to be a resource to everybody and certainly feel free to link in with me following this. If I don't have the information, I also have a great network of professionals who also want to find a way to give back right now. So here. To I help. love that because no one has all the solutions, right? And so what you're doing is standing in the gap and thank you for making that offer. Thank you. So, you know, I think that the first and most glaring change is the change based on the stay at home guidance that many of us are faced with. And that's transformed our 
organizations and our workforces rapidly into remote workforces in many instances. And the change to remote work is a significant impact to how we communicate, how we collaborate, um, and it also raises a number of compliance and risk concerns uh, mm -hmm. from a human resources standpoint. Uh, many of us are using tools like Zoom, Google Meet, or Google Hangouts. Um, there are many live uh, freeconferencecall.com. There are many tools available uh, to collaborate uh, via the web, but many of those tools are recording our conversations, which is a shift for organizations mm -hmm. and um, many of us, particularly in the human resources nonprofit sector are working with um, privileged information. Uh, so, so one of the things that is important is not only to think about the impact of remote work as it changes how we communicate and collaborate with each other, but also as nonprofit organizations to take a moment to think about how the shift to what could be a potentially recorded um, and more public setting collaboration may impact how we share and transfer privileged information with one another um, within our organizations. And um, that's an important concern. There are many resources available to us following the call. I'll share a few of the uh, free resources that are available oh, due, to this, uh, due to this coronavirus where we have free access to share resource tools that will be valuable not only during this period, but potentially in the future as well. That would be great. There's so many changes, I think, that will come from this. Mm -hmm. I think that this is, you know, as disruption does, it breaks open old processes and systems and entrenched behaviors and reveals not only opportunities, but as you pointed out, maybe some of the risks, right? How to share this kind of privileged information remotely. Absolutely. And, and recording data um, is something that many of us had not previously utilized. It can be a blessing mm -hmm. uh, in that if we're having a board meeting during this period of time, we have outstanding opportunity to record from a minute to notes for transparency for those people who are interested in mm -hmm. better understanding our goals and guidelines as nonprofits. Um, but also, what information are we sharing? How recently have we done a uh, inclusive language training for our staff and volunteers to make sure that everything that's being reported matches our cultural standards as an org? Mm -hmm. um, that's, these are all important things for us to think about. Interesting. What are some of the um, other shifts that might be happening? So certainly the, the policy process alignment on, on the concept of sharing privilege information and recording. Um, are there other considerations as far as managing HR through remote uh, or through distance, right? Absolutely. Or has anything changed, right? Absolutely. So, so timekeeping uh, is another key area of concern for many organizations, um, particularly as we look at the non-exempt staff members uh, within our organizations uh, and as we look at uh, independent workers. So there are guidance um, at the federal level for how we classify exempt and non-exempt and at the state and local level as well. This idea of uh, who's an hourly wage worker and who's a salaried wage worker based on skill sets. Um, and what we're allowed to do in terms of required recording shifts based on those groups of people. It also shifts with independent contract work. Um, you can inadvertently set up an employee standard relationship with somebody by requiring them to follow a structured process around time, recording, process around how work gets done and when work gets done. Um, there's an ABC checklist for employment uh, standards and whether or not somebody's an employee. And so this idea of wage work um, and time and recording is a really important concept and one we don't have to think about in the face-to-face -face work environment. So uh, can we just stop and go a little bit deeper because that makes sense. 
but there feels like there should be a and so here's <laughs> some ideas right <laughs> absolutely and so there are uh, there are a few things that we recommend when working with organizations around timekeeping one is to set up a policy internally based on your local guidance on what is uh, a classification it's a simple check sheet to classify is somebody exempt or non-exempt is somebody an employee versus a volunteer and there are thresholds um, based on that abc checklist that we recommend so just a very simple checklist for what skill sets fall into that category the second is how do we record time one during a period like this it's incredibly important to trust your staff um, mm. creating a culture of support inclusion um, and trust through this period of chaos will help your organization to keep a healthy flow of employee and employer relationship as you move out of this period and, and we will move out of this period so trust is a really important foundation right now and a simple tool that's applied against all of your non-exempt employees and there are free tools available to us online again um, in the resources that i'll share i'll share a few internally we like to use toggle uh, which is a very simple timekeeping tool um, that has a free option there are several free online uh, timekeeping tools that you can begin to use that not only allow you to record when somebody's working, but can actually help with productivity and time management as well. Great. So um, earlier this week, we've had a great lineup of experts like yourself, and it's been a great progression from uh, last Friday, Dr. Ruben Ross walked us through the emotion of what's happening and just accepting and acknowledging we're grieving and we're changing all the way through to where we are today. And along that journey, uh, there was a recommendation or an idea that working remotely shifts the way that you perform, right? So when we touched base on this a little bit before we went live, we did a lot of drive-by in our office. So we all were doing our own thing and we would hear or we would need someone. And so now we don't do that because we're apart, but we focus more now, we've decided to set up projects for each one of the staff members. How does that impact when someone is either exempt or non-exempt? Is that a valid method for starting to calculate productivity and, and output rather than action, which is what we used to measure before? Absolutely. So um, again, there are local variances to exempt and non-exempt status. Uh, however, um, projects are a wonderful way to organize information. Um, mm -hmm. where, where the exempt, non-exempt status shifts often is in supervisory responsibility. And mm -hmm. so being aware of um, who within your organization, when you're in, an, in a work environment, has a supervisory role versus those people who um, in your organization or in hourly or task-based roles. That's mm -hmm. the easiest primary um, attribute to evaluate. That doesn't mean that somebody who's in a non-exempt role can't take point on particular tasks within a project or particular programs, um, but the structure outline of supervision should come from your exempt employees. Interesting. Um, very complex, but when you start to unravel it, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. And there is so much information online trying to convey it um, over a teleconference, certainly yeah. a video conference, certainly makes it sound a lot more complicated than it is. Most of the state departments of labor have a really simple ABC checklist um, or a threshold checklist, they often call it, to evaluate is somebody exempt or non-exempt. And they, they even have lists of what functional roles typically fall into that criteria. Um, but what I love about what you said, Sandra, was about the collaboration and communication and how, how work shifts when we move from working in a centralized work environment to distributed work. And there are real advantages that can come from this period of time as well around how we communicate with each other, around really taking an opportunity to benchmark 
what is our culture around how work is shared? What is our organizational culture around how we report back accomplishments and achievements as a staff? Um, and, and it gives us an opportunity to really recognize and reward employees and volunteers within our organizations in a way that we might not take the time to do when we're operating in a status quo of the drive-by, as you said, in the office where we're used to how we're, we're moving. Um, this gives us an opportunity to really recognize the contributions all of our staff members make, whether they're paid or volunteer. You know, I was part of a, um... I was part, I was blessed to be part invited in by a venture capitalist we work with to an executive's uh, mentoring session yesterday at four o'clock by Zoom, a big webinar, a well-known speaker, Jeremy, uh, well-known that I forgot his name, uh, Jeremy Kubicek, Kubicek, A-U-B-I-C. Okay. Um, and I bring this up because you talk about culture. And we talked about culture and there was something there that struck me that I remembered when you said that. And that is crisis always highlights or heightens the culture of an organization. So it brings it into really strong uh, base relief as to what that culture really is. And he said, pay attention to that because culture always trumps strategy. So my question is, as nonprofits are seeing or as a nonprofit's culture is being revealed through this crisis, what are some of the things that the nonprofit can put on a, in a parking lot to talk about and get to to resolve at a time when this all settles down? Oh, that's that is such a wonderful concept. I'll acknowledge um, that the idea of culture trumping strategy mm. um, is very, very aligned with on its axis, our philosophy of products and people, um, looking at your business objective, whether you're for-profit or non-profit, um, you could have the best product conceptually, but it's truly the people that will allow you to innovate, stay relevant in the market, differentiate from your competitors. And, and we're very much aligned to that idea of culture building. One of the things that, that we, we organizationally believe in is authenticity um, and alignment mm. and this idea of alignment comes from really taking the time to establish your pillars um, we, re we refer to it being grounded in product as a roadmap um, whether it's your hiring roadmap or it's your fundraising and development roadmap or it's your organizational culture roadmap these are the key concepts, the values that you hold dear as an organization, and really taking the time to identify those pillars, those core values, and then look at how do, how do all of your programs, how do all of your day-to-day -day staff activities align to those core values? The better job we can do at being consistent, at setting up people's individual objectives and key results to align with those core company and cultural core values, the more productive we're all going to be. And so my number one advice during this period is to take this moment to reset, to, to look back at, and I know many of us did this in the third and fourth quarter of last year as we entered the new decade, take a minute to look back at that you know, three year, five year, decade roadmap that you created and, and look at how consistent are we across our goals and objective as a business? How does that line up with how we operate day to day? And how does that line up with many organizations are still using key performance indicators rather than objectives and key results? How does that line up with how we're compensating how we're measuring the performance of our internal staff, of our programs. How does that align with the grants that we're reaching out to get funded on? How does that line up with our kind of grant core responses? And are those still all true? So really taking a look at your organization and lining up the core aspects of your roadmap with your overall objectives and looking for gaps. That's mm. my number one objective 
our recommendation for that aspect. And for many of us, we do have that time. I, I think the first few days of this um, quarantine, at least for our firm, we just started this this past Monday. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of us were still in Connecticut anyways, going into work the week before until Governor Lamont said, no more, you have to, unless you're essential. And while we could argue we're essential for nonprofits, he didn't agree. <laughs> so this has been, <laughs> so this has been our first week. And um, I have to say the first few days, uh, felt as if a flurry of papers and ideas and leaves fell down all around us and we were just trying to sort through them. Mm. But now that we've gotten into this groove, last night was probably the first night that I ended work at six o'clock and then left it. And this mm. morning got up and thought, okay, I now have time to think. So for many of us, this first week has been chaotic. But we're all going to be in a place where we do have time to reflect. And what a great opportunity, right? So there's always there, there's always opportunity in crisis. I truly believe that. And this is one of them to just see the pause button and reflect on this. Absolutely. I think that this is a time when we probably feel more harried, mm. even as nonprofit professionals, um, because of what you said earlier. This is a this is change and um, change does impact us. It impacts us emotionally and it impacts us um, in how we connect with the people in our personal lives as well. Our, our routines have been disrupted and when that happens, it can be unsettling mm -hmm. and it gives us an opportunity to reset. And so I recently published an article on Thrive Global, more of a, a personal recommendation on how to uh, respond to this change. But it was, allow yourself the room to remove your current weekly goals, to remove your current productivity standards and give yourself that space as you adapt to this change and look at how can you reprioritize? How, what's, what's most important right now? How can you reset? Where can you ask for help? Um, this is a really great opportunity for us to get comfortable with reevaluating what does our network look like? What does community look like? And how can I get comfortable for, with asking for support? Whether it's from members of my team or it's from a sister, a cousin, a family member or a friend that you haven't connected with in a while. Um, this is a chance to really reset around that. And, and I want to acknowledge that an important HR consideration that's, that's happening for many nonprofit organizations is that we do have to look at what staff can we afford to keep on and layoffs are part of the conversation right now. And that means many of us in the nonprofit sector are faced with unexpected work. Um, so while some of us have the, the, the great blessing to be able to continue on and focus and work during this period, there are many of us that are really facing uncertain times. And uh, following our call, I'll share a bit of information about um, how, how organizations can look at layoffs, benefits, applying sick time during this period, um, and some, some really wonderful articles by other experts on how to, when you are faced with layoffs, um, how to pursue that in a way that's both legally compliant and uh, allows your organization to be able to come out through this in a successful way, if possible. And so, yeah. So, I mean, if this is the fourth point, this to me, uh, from what I'm reading and seeing and hearing, the noise and the clatter around this is significant. I think there's a lot of confusion about what uh, can and cannot be done. There's a lot of confusion around what you can and cannot ask of the uh, employees. A lot of confusion on what is furlough, what, it, what is letting go. There's differences. Um, and then also a lot of hope, but also concern and confusion around what is the government going to provide us? So I am now on a journey to find uh, what is actually in this bill that was adopted on Wednesday and now just has to be signed regarding reimbursement for small business and nonprofit mm. for, uh, or not reimbursement, loans 
for things like salary and utilities and insurance. There is some information through the communication line that if you retain your staff and you take out this loan, that at some point that will be forgiven, that piece with salary, which is a huge incentive for nonprofits who are living on that edge and see that they have the, the reserves possibly to keep staff on for another two months, but they're afraid of using those reserves without actually filling them back in. So if we could clear some of that up, I think that would make a lot of people that are leading nonprofits so much more comfortable and clear about the direction they're going. Absolutely. I think that these are certainly unprecedented times. Uh, mm -hmm. It was reported yesterday over 3.3 million people have filed for unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, the Senate bill that uh, proceeded to the House um, allocated, uh, as you mentioned, changes to the unemployment law that allowed for an additional $600 a month and an additional uh, four month extension from the federal level on unemployment. Uh, it also allowed for um, gig employees in many cases who would not have been eligible for the application for unemployment in many markets to have a path to eligibility. Um, however, there is very little information about one, uh, to what extent this will reach uh, the people who have already applied, to what extent this will apply to nonprofits. And I think additionally for nonprofits, there's, there's been this historic guidance that it's better to keep your debt low when um, looking at grants. And so there's a resistance in the nonprofit sector at applying for or looking at SBA loans um, because of the potential fear of the impact on grant funding. And so I think that, that there is a lot of confusion in this space right now. I'm certainly not a financial expert, um, but what I can say from a human resources standpoint is that how you approach your talent through this period, the extent that you can be consistent in your communication, that if you don't know, you convey what you don't know, that you can make sure that you are taking the time to plan that communication and not doing it in that ad hoc drive-by way, um, being as informed as possible with the data that's available to you in the moment will allow you to make sure that you have the best team culture coming out of this and it will help you to mitigate risk. Um, there are some compliance pitfalls that you can face if you make promises to staff. For example, I've heard through my network that some organizations are saying, I'm going to furlough you so that you can receive unemployment. And if you keep volunteering for us in the meantime, there'll be a bonus for you when you get back. In many states, that creates a... Uh, um, an employment, an employer risk, uh, a false promise of employment, um, and it, it puts the nonprofit at risk. Uh, mm -hmm. So really being careful, looking at your state guidance and, and being disciplined about, about how you communicate around layoffs. Um, and don't just go silent. Silence is a productivity killer in a time of confusion. If you don't know, Clarify that you're looking into it. Share what you're doing to try to come to certainty. Help people to understand that you're looking at the financials, that you're, you're reaching out to the experts um, to come back with information. But, but again, that authenticity and alignment are gonna be really key during this time of uncertainty. Absolutely. I think that, you know, the whole staffing, staff retention, there remains these lingering areas of confusion and doubt about that. Is there a resource that people can go to, either on your site or on their state site, that can help clarify some of the high-risk things that they need to be aware of? Absolutely. So following, following our conversation today, we'll share with you, Sandra, um, there are three resources that I lean on. The American Staffing Association is a fantastic resource. Um, the California Staffing Association actually has free resources available that they're trying to clarify specifically around COVID-19 that are available um, for those of you in the California market. 
you know, Pennsylvania is also doing this. So I'll share several of the free resources. Many, even if you're not a member, are offering the membership level resources for free for a period of time right now. Great. Excellent. And we'll make sure that we get them posted somewhere so that people that are viewing this now and then people that view the recording will be able to get them. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we're closing in on the end. What, what is, are there any other things that we should be thinking about? I, I think fifth, my fifth point, which is the optimistic point, is that prior to this unfortunate circumstance, we were looking at one of the most optimistic entries to a decade that we've had um, in a very long time. We had the consistently lowest unemployment level. Um, I spent so much time helping to coach organizations on how to attract step talent in a um, talent scarce market. This is a time for those of your organizations that were scaling to look at strategic hiring. Uh, this is a time when talent acquisition, your hiring roadmap, thinking about what the core uh, programs that your organization is gonna face and where you might have had internal talent gaps prior to this period is a very smart choice. Mm -hmm. You have a workforce that's available to interview. You have um, the opportunity to reach talent that hasn't otherwise been um, able to be reached. And it's an opportunity for you to establish yourself as a brand employer that's incredibly stable. Um, so for those of you, organiz the organizations here uh, who did have ambitious goals, I, I would really look at that talent acquisition and hiring strategy and look at what can still be done remote and virtual um, as we come out of this period, because there's a real opportunity for us to innovate and, and, and leave this with momentum that can really help serve all of our um, member audiences. That is such a great point to end on. We have a couple of clients that prior to a couple of weeks ago, we were in the middle of recruitment work with and uh, all of them to a T called and said, should we put this on the shelf? And our advice, and I'm so, thank you for validating it, was no, <laughs> this is the best time. There are displaced professionals that have really good qualifications that could serve what you're looking for. So um, we've even actually continued on with some prospects who are looking to, you know, launch some recruitment. So um, any resources for displaced professionals? I know we're pulling together our own um, group for displaced nonprofit professionals to give them some uh, development work, some advice on interviewing and things like that, but anything nationally that um, we would point to for people that have lost their positions? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So there are a lot of agencies right now that are working to try to help the candidate market internally and on its axis. Um, we do have a niche uh, staffing arm around uh, serving our client base and so certainly would welcome uh, those of you who would match our experience to reach out. Uh, additionally, there are many resources available for the nonprofit sector, uh, for professionals in the nonprofit sector to be able to collaborate. Um, one that I think many nonprofits aren't aware of is a tool called Handshake. Uh, Handshake is a, a job um, management job posting system for university settings. And Handshake allows universities uh, to post career opportunities um, to connect for-profit and nonprofit employer with university alumni. So many of us in the nonprofit sector um, have a university background. So certainly reach back out to your alumni network um, for opportunities within that space, um, not only for internal job postings, but also employers who are working with universities to attract talent through Handshake. I love it. I love it. Kelly, thank you so much. I feel like we could just keep talking about this <laughs> all afternoon. This is one of those topics that I think, you know, if I had to identify the three critical things that we are working with nonprofits nationally on, this is one of them. <clears throat> Obviously, funding, being relevant, how do we 
uh, make ourselves present in sharing and doing something to help while also retaining our donor base, right? Mm -hmm. And then the third really is that kind of leadership hope, like where are we after all of the dust settles mm -hmm. and the disruption is over? So thank you for sharing on this. We would love to stay in touch with you. Uh, we may, uh, after the three weeks that we're doing this daily is over, uh, you know, we certainly don't have the resources to keep doing this daily, but because we're in this space now we do, but we're going to keep doing it weekly. So we would love to have you back on that. And maybe we can go a little bit deeper into this and other topics regarding uh, employment, HR and hiring. Thank you so much, Sandra. Really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and the community. Excellent. We will uh, see everybody again tomorrow at noon at our Do Good Better lunch and live streams. And uh, uh, follow us, uh, hit notifications so you know who's coming up uh, tomorrow. And um, we will see you all then. Thank you again, Kelly. Have a great day out in California. Hope the weather's good. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Stay healthy.